guys hear me okay? Okay, good. My name is Bill Eastman. I work with Riverbed Technologies, um, who is one of the main sponsors of this event. We are the corporate sponsor for Wireshark. I'm sure everybody probably realizes that. And I'm here today to talk to you about a couple things that you might want to do with packets. Not that you guys don't already know what in the world to do with packets. In fact, of the people that I talk to, the people in this room are probably among the most packet-centric that I ever work with, right? If you're at this conference, you love packet data. But there's actually quite a few things that you can do with packets that maybe you, we, we can show you how to do it easier or maybe things that you probably couldn't even do. So I'm going to show you some technology for that. Um, I'm also going to show you one of the ways to obtain packet data when perhaps it's a little bit more painful to sometimes do that. Now, Riverbed has, uh, by the way, anybody familiar with the OpNet brand? Anybody heard of OpNet? Okay. I am from OpNet. Now I'm Riverbed. We got, a, we got um, acquired and now we're merged with Riverbed. And so this is OpNet technology. You'll recognize some splash screens if you've seen it before. Um, and um, it's, it's now part of the Riverbed RPM Riverbed Performance Management suite of tools. So one of the things that people do is obviously you need to get packets. Hopefully I can avoid feedback here. And I hate being up on this stage because I like to pace a lot and if I fall off, you know, I don't, I, that would be a problem. But packets, getting them can sometimes be a pain. We have appliances that help with that, but sometimes A, you don't want to go to the expense of buying an appliance. Um, although I love getting appliances that capture packets because it's very powerful. And B, sometimes you want packets from an area for which there is no appliance. You can't get to that network. You can't get over there and get that data conveniently. So what you're probably doing now, if you're not using this type of technology, is you're probably having people run Wireshark and run PCAP locally to try to get the packets. Sound familiar to everybody? And you have to walk the user, who is not often a packet engineer, did I say that politely enough? Um, to walk through that process to get the data then you have to retrieve it, and then you have to look at it, okay? So it can be a pain. So I want to show you one of, the, uh, of one of the ways that we can help you with that. So what we have are packet agents. There's capture agents, and what they do is you can deploy those to each and every machine in your enterprise. So you can deploy these everywhere. So you don't have to go out and actually sit there or talk somebody through the process, if it's, if it's an agent's installed, you can capture from their machine remotely from your desk. We also are going to talk about Packet Trace Warehouse, which allows you to configure and control those agents and pull, pull back data to where you can put it into Wireshark, you can put it into transaction analysis, I'll show you uh, the tool that we have for that. And we're also going to do some application mapping, taking data and mapping out applications so that you know what an application is doing, which peers are involved with the transaction, et cetera. Very, very powerful stuff. If there are any questions, by the way, at any point, please let me know, and, uh, and I'll stop and we can talk, uh, talk about that. So packet traces are key to troubleshooting. Uh, our, um, our key troubleshooting tool, excuse me. You guys probably know that being you're here, so I don't have to really sell you on that concept. Packet traces are the best and sometimes the only way to troubleshoot a problem. And in my opinion, I'm very packet-centric, and I, I mean, you can get data from servers, but frankly, I like to see what the data is going across the wire. They're a direct form of evidence, and you can get deep. Not only can you look at high-level stuff, but obviously, if you guys are here looking at, um, uh, at SharkFest, you're looking deeply to try to see what's going on inside of an application. Packets have been challenging to acquire. We just talked about that. You have to go get hardware. And like I said, whereas uh, appliances that capture packets are fantastic and extremely powerful, and I promote those all the time, if I have a customer out in Timbuktu somewhere, how in the world am I going to get data from their box? And so that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Using agents, you can get packet capture and retrieval. You put these on the end user station, and you can then do a capture from their machine. Also, you can put one on the server and do a capture from that. In fact, you can do a capture from both simultaneously and then merge that data together to see exact latencies across a wide area network. Um, you can also capture on the back end while that's happening and see what calls are being made back there. Very, very powerful way to look at data, and you can control those all centrally, start and stop the captures, or use continuous capture, which I'll talk about a little bit. So we have packet capture agents. They support AIX, FreeBSD, HPUX, Linux, 
Mac OS, unfortunately, not Intel yet. We're working on that. Solaris, Windows. Um, makes packet capture easy to acquire. Again, you can put these everywhere. So you can, uh, in fact, one of my customers has over 30,000 of these deployed. So you can have packet cap capture points everywhere. You can capture from multiple points simultaneously. So it's a real good way to get a view to your network. And then somebody asks, well, gosh, this is on clients and servers and middleware. What about if I set up a laptop with, or a, or a desktop with fewer NICs on it and stick it on there to make a, a poor man's appliance for packet capture? Can I do that? And the answer would be yes. So you can stick that on a stand port if you wanted to do that and then remotely control and look at those captures as well. You can do on-demand capture, which means you start and you stop a capture and then pull that data back to look at it. But you can also do continuous capture, which means that I'm going to, you guys have probably all run into the situation where you've had the user that calls up and says, hey, I had a problem. Well, yeah. Well, it was at 10 this morning. Well, I know it's 1 o'clock. I had to go to lunch. Well, can you troubleshoot it? No, it's three hours ago, right? So how in the world do you go back in time? You can set up a continuous capture using one of these agents on their box, and you can allocate a couple gigs. And nowadays, a couple gigs is cheap, right? I mean, everybody has massive drives now. You allocate a couple gigs, and you just let it roll through that. So the next time they complain, you can say, well, jot, jot down the time that there was an issue, go back in time, go back into that buffer and pull that data out. Also, there's even a method, and we'll talk about that as we go through the uh, demonstration, where you can say to them, I'll tell you what, we'll set up a continuous capture on your box. In fact, you set it up on their box, but you can also set it up on the server they're accessing and maybe a backend system that might be related. And you can put a web link on their desktop. And you say, when you have the problem, click on that web link, they'll log in, They'll say it, whether the problem happened within the past five minutes or 10 minutes. And then and they can tell you a little bit of description what it did. And then what the system will do is it will go back, grab that five or 10 minutes off their machine and off of every other machine that you had set up for that, put those to the side and let you know so that you can go back in time and look at it. So it's an extremely powerful way to obtain packet data. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, yes, okay, so the question was, is that a particular product um, y the, with the web link and the end user driven capture? Yes, it's part of the packet trace warehouse, um, part of the RPM suite. So it's the, the product I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna show you an in-depth of that, uh, of demonstration of that, but yes, it's part of that package. Okay. Also, for security, if I have agents out there that can capture packets, I need them to be secure. So you can use certificated encryption and access control. You can lock things down um, and basically you have to authenticate through the tr packet trace warehouse to get to the packet uh, capture agent so that you can lock things down. You can also set various levels. In fact, one of the things that, uh, and I'll show you in a few moments, but I can set up a level where somebody can start a capture but they can't pull data, which is very useful if I have an engineer that um, maybe a help desk person that it might be more of a sensitive situation. They can go start a capture and then they let me know I can come back in and get that data later. Okay. So there's a number of things that you can do uh, with access control. I'll show you what that looks like. Packet trace warehouse. That's what we're, that's what I've been talking about. It delivers a centralized control of these agents. And by the way, the, the, the first question people typically ask is how much does it cost to put an agent out on a machine? And the answer is it doesn't. You uh, get this product, you can deploy agents as much as you want. You can manage up to a certain number at once for a certain type of license for the packet trace warehouse, but you can still have the agents everywhere. So it's very, very useful to be able to do that. Um, it enables easy deployment of agents across enterprise, reduces total cost of ownership to manage large scale agent deployments. That's why we built this, is actually our agents, these packet capture agents were part of something called App Transaction Expert. Anybody ever hear of that? Okay, that's where these agents came from. By the way, you might, uh, those of you that didn't raise your hand may know it as uh, Ace Analyst. Okay, that's the older name. Okay, so we have somebody who's used this before. So that's where these agents came from. And that's what the Packet Trace Warehouse does is it goes out and controls those agents. And we decided we decoupled those agents from App Transaction Expert so that people can use them for Wireshark and also use them for the App Transaction Expert. Okay, it's a web-based capture operations. You know, that's a big, normally I like to look back, but it's so big, I'm gonna look down here. I hate doing that, but that's what you have to do. I don't, again, I don't wanna fall off the stage. You can start and stop captures from the web-based console, so you basically log in, 
you can access, you can start and stop captures, you can preview captures, we'll do that. You can download captures, you can configure and save templates. Now a template's nice because you can set up a template that says this is what I want to do, These, this is a real common type of capture I want to do, and you can just deploy a template and say, okay, I'm going to do this again and start this kind of capture. It allows us to go out and discover agents. One of the problems that a lot of our customers have is they put agents out there in troubleshooting mode, and they do it over here, then 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 they do it over here, and then they forgot about those over there. I mean, you guys are probably familiar with that kind of thing. I mean, you're running around trying to troubleshoot stuff. You don't have time to keep track of all these things. Everybody tries. Typically, what method is used? Spreadsheet or something. That's not real fun. So what we can do is we can go out and discover the agents going out there and looking for them and then reporting back which systems have those agents installed. Also user management. You want to set user roles, you want to set privileges. Um, I'll show you what that looks like. All activity is logged so that you can see who did what, which is very convenient. And then you can hook it into your LDAP, your AD, your PACX, et cetera, right? Okay. Now, we're gonna go, and I'll do give you a demonstration of that in just a few moments. But what do you do with that data? Well, you guys obviously know the troubleshooting world. Right? You guys obviously do that, you're here with, with Wireshark. But also you can use it to map out an application and I'm gonna do a demonstration of that. We're gonna go ahead and I'll show you a, a, a mapping of an application and I'll tell you a, uh, actually some, uh, a, a tale when I was at a customer site that was kind of fun. But the idea is, is I, the ability to take data and then build a diagram of what that application's doing, which systems it's talking to, which peers are involved. Very, very useful when you guys are trying to go in and troubleshoot a problem. How many of you have ever had to go and do a troubleshoot a problem and you say to the development team or the ops team or whoever, hey, I okay, which servers are involved in this application? And they say, I don't know, <laughs> right, right? So, and then at best, they go to a file cabinet and they open it up and they pull out the manila folder and they put the cobwebs off of it and they say, well, this is what it's supposed to do, right? You guys have seen that before. Well. Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Obviously something's not happening the way it's supposed to and this will help you figure out um, if that's involved with other systems that were not intended. Also, troubleshooting. Now, Wireshark, fantastic for troubleshooting and doing analysis. However, two, a couple different things. First of all, Wireshark, especially with a complex transaction, can take time. It takes somebody who really knows what they're doing to, to do that, right? So you usually have your upper echelon of engineers who are packet experts that use Wireshark, and then you have everybody else, right? And the people that are here are those experts, okay? Problem is, is that not everybody can attend SharkFest, for instance. Not everybody is a packet head. In fact, what, you, what, what sometimes happens, you have good engineers who don't have years of experience playing with packets. We can help by analyzing a lot of the data for them that's in the packets and showing things visually in a way that um, allows people to do troubleshooting very quickly. In fact, this makes me look really smart, so don't tell anybody, but this, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of what I do is I look smart because of this tool, okay? So that's what this does is it helps you analyze transactions, does automatic diagnosis, it'll show you where the components of delay are. Um, it integrates with uh, App and Kernels Expert, which is a server-based tool. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with that. A couple people are, excellent. And it helps you rapidly troubleshoot things. It also does prediction, and we're gonna do that today. I'll show you an example of that. Okay, one of the other things that it really does that I like a lot is even if it doesn't tell you what the problem is automatically, it can show you patterns. You know, I always, I, I have two little girls and we'll go lay out in the grass sometimes and look up at the clouds. And you, it's amazing how your brain's desperately trying to make, uh, or my, my girl, for my girls especially, unicorns and stuff like that, right? And the reason is, is the brain looks for patterns. Well, seeing data in a graphical format, packet data, will allow your, you to find patterns and identify things even if combing through the packet data you'd miss it. And that's one of the things that we can do with this technology. And I'll show you a, co a couple things like that. It also does prediction. Now prediction is extremely powerful. Not just in what you would think it would be. Let's, uh, a typical scenario is, I want to move this application from here to over here. That's prediction, right? But instead of that, let's say, oh, somebody comes to you and says, we have a network problem. Anybody ever hear that it's a network problem? <laughs> right? It's always a network problem. At least that's what everybody's opinion is except the network folks who know that probably 90 some odd percent of the time it's not a network problem. How do I prove that? 
Okay? Well, prediction is a very useful way to really make your point, sometimes a little obnoxiously. I like to do it where I put ridiculous amounts of bandwidth in there and say, look, if I give you a terabit, this is the performance improvement you're going to get. Because you, with, you, with prediction, you can say, I can give you the bandwidth you keep harping on, and it's not going to help you, so I can do predictive troubleshooting. Here, let's look what happens if I do this. Will you get what you hope? And that's a very powerful workflow, and I will do that as well with you guys today. Okay, and then reporting. How often do you guys take packet traces? You know what's going on, you know the problem, you try to go explain that to somebody, and, they, and their eyes glass over. Ever happen? Right? So having the ability to show data in a meaningful way is very, very important. And um, that's one of the things we provide. In fact, what we'll probably do, it depends on how much time we have, um, I might do a live capture with you guys, and we'll just go through the whole process of, uh, of um, analyzing something just to show you what it looks like, okay? All right, by the way, you know they say a picture's worth a thousand words? I think a demo is worth at least a thousand PowerPoints. So you have seen the last PowerPoint from me, okay? So let's go ahead and close this. Let's take a look. First, I'm gonna talk about the packet trace warehouse. Okay, so this is the interface. This is logged in, and I've got dozens or hundreds or thousands of agents out there, and I can go out and do stuff with them. So one of the things I can do is I can go out and I can start a capture. So I go out and I would specify the agent name. So I would put in a DNS name or, or an IP address. It would go out, talk to the agent, bring it back, show me the NIC card, and allow me to start doing a capture, okay? Now, what's cool about that, it, let me see, I'll just probably do a better to just manage a capture here. So I can do a search for a particular, for a particular agent. Let's see it actually, let me go ahead and do it under agent. But the idea is, is I can go and start, I can go out and do a, hold on a sec. I can look for agents, by the way, it, I, I, you can do it by mine, just stuff that I'm working on so I don't see everybody else's junk or I can look for everything. So in this case, we have a, a uh, system here capturing. So by going out and looking at that, I can see that it's this system, it's capturing, um, this is the IP address, and this is the interface it's capturing on. So you can go out and specify which interface, which system, and you can also specify how much disk space it's allowed to use, and go out and do a capture. Any questions? You should be able to search on IP, on name, Yes. Um, you just type it in. You got host name right here, the capture name, um, description, but your, yeah, your IP address, it, it should be able to go out and find it for you. Okay, so you can go out and also manage your agents. So here are the, all the agents that we have here. I can go in and start talking to those agents, see what captures are running on them, um, modify them, look at what interfaces, or, uh, interfaces there are, update the status. Again, go out, find these agents, and do captures on them. Okay, now think about when you guys are trying to do stuff, right? You, you guys know how to use Wireshark and analyze stuff, but a lot of the battle is to get that data. With these agents, if you have them deployed, especially if you can leave them deployed and you can put security on them with, through this, you'll be able to go out and get data anytime you want from any system in your enterprise. Any questions? Okay. You also have filters. Filters are great because you can just create a filter, you can create many different filters, and then when you want to go start a capture, you deploy a filter to that agent so that you can say, okay, I really don't care about anything but IP. Or I do, or, or, or um, uh, I, uh, TCP IP, I don't want anything that's, that's just IP, I want TCP, because that's what I know I'm looking for. Or maybe I want everything wide open, maybe I want everything the NIC card sees. Or maybe I just want this protocol, or maybe I just want these servers. You can do all of that, you can do it through graphical interface, as you can see, you can do this kind of thing. You can also do it with uh, BPF filters as well. So you set that up, you create a set of filters that you'll use, Nice thing is, is creating this set means you get to use them over and over, and then you can push that out to a, an agent anytime you wish. Also, you can capture on an agent more than one time, meaning that I can have a capture running on that agent for this server. Maybe I have this set of filters on it, and I don't wanna mess with that because that's really important. I'm waiting because they've had an intermittent problem, but then somebody comes up and says, I need you to capture this. Well, I can just 
start another capture on that same agent, there's no problem with that at the same time with a different set of filters. Okay. Obviously at some point you can do too many captures and you can start having a little bit of overhead, but generally these captures are extremely friendly. Okay, any questions? Okay, now application mapping. What we can do, and this is kind of boring here, but you can take and go into your data center or go into a bunch of systems or on a span port, which is actually one of the ways I would recommend it because a lot of times you don't know what you're looking for. Take an agent, you go and you tell, you tell the agent, I want you to be an application mapping agent now. Forget grabbing all the packets and keeping them. I want you to watch the traffic as it goes by and I want you to um, see who initiates the conversations and is the client, who is the server, what protocol is being used. What are the, uh, how is the communication taking place, and log all of that so I can take it in later and do an application mapping exercise. What's nice about that is you can leave it, it takes very little space because you can have it on a very busy link, but it's not doing, it's not storing a lot of data, it's storing metadata about the conversation. And then you can use that data to map out a, a, an application. And I'll show you a map in just a moment, I'll, I'll create one with you. Users. Here's, the, here's where the permissions are stored. So I have all these agents deployed all over my network. And what I want to do, let me list users. Let me go grab myself. I'll just go grab me. And I'll show you if I have the right to do whatever. Well, actually, we're going to do the um, permissions. So I can take a user and I can give them different abilities. So they could be, as in my case here, the admin. Of course, we all know an admin can do whatever, right, to administer the bots. Um, they could administrate, uh, administer all the agents, okay? Also, I can say, I want this person to be able to do application mapping. I don't want them to be able to pull captures because this is sensitive information maybe on this set of servers, but I do want them to be able to go out and start up some mapping captures and pull that data back for me because I don't have the time to do it right now, for instance. Or I can have them administer uh, applications. The application would be where you create a template that says this is what this application is if somebody reports a problem. I can have them start agents or stop agents or delete the captures or preview the agents or download, but you notice that those are separate rights. Okay, so that you can really finely and in fine detail say what somebody is allowed to do, which is very nice because again, you can open up the ability to start captures and, e and that type of thing to a group of people that may be larger than, than you would normally do because of security concerns. Um, troubleshoots, this would mean that this is the person that would get a notification that there's a problem with an app that somebody else reported, which is this report problem right here. This is that. I'm gonna go and click and say, hey, I'm gonna report a problem. I'll show you what just what the interface looks like at the, at the initial part of that. Okay, and then app internals, I'm not gonna cover that. There's no packets with that. So, if I was going to report a problem, I told you about that workflow. What it is is that you would go to that person's computer using, using this, start a continuous capture. Okay, you would deploy an agent, you start a continuous capture, maybe a gig, maybe two, depends on how much disk space you've got. You would also tell them, or you'd also set it up and say, okay, this person uses Exchange, because Exchange is one of those things you guys probably deal with a lot, right? So this person's using Exchange. Exchange is between this, their computer and, the, and this set of servers over here, because that's the stuff that they do for Exchange. And actually, I might be curious, because Exchange can sometimes pull data from this file server back here, I also want captures on that. So I'm gonna put agents on all of those with a rolling buffer. This person also uses um, SharePoint, okay? And they're talking to this set of servers over here. So when they're talking to this set of servers for SharePoint, I don't want those captured or I don't wanna record that particular issue. I want it to look at this set of servers. And so you set up a different set of applications that this person can report on. Then you re let their continuous capture roll. And then you give them a link to a website. And then they're sitting there working and something goes wrong, something gets slow. And they go in and they say, I wanna report a problem. So they go and they say, I want to report a problem. If I can click on it today. And it says, okay, please choose which application. And note that you've assigned that person a set of applications they can report about. So they're gonna pick which application they wanna report on. And the problem happened within the last 10 minutes or five minutes. 
Now, why do we put that here? Why do I have 10 and 5? Why not just 10? It's be because they pay more attention if you have higher granularity that they have to pay attention to, okay? It's, it's just magic. With user, if they'll report it three hours late if they don't have these two limits put on them, right? So here it says, go in, click on that within the last five minutes and submit that report. When you click submit, and I don't have an agent set up for this right now, so I'm not gonna do that on my laptop, but it will then go and present one more screen for them to type in a description of what happened, and then they submit that, and it goes and it waits for you in a queue. What happens in the background is, is that on their continuous capture, the system goes and says, okay, I'm gonna go back in time, five minutes or 10 minutes, on this, and then it actually thinks there's a little bit of slop on that. This system had this stuff, capture it, set it to the side, and don't roll it out of that buffer. And then it goes to this, like for the exchange, goes to the client machine and does that, and then let's say I set it up so that the server, it goes to that server and says that, and then it goes back to that back end and does that. So that when you come in later, you have a little thing that says, I had a problem. And then you can go in and there's a capture from all three of the servers that you care about waiting for you to go in and look at. It's very powerful. Does it sound useful for some of the stuff you guys may have to deal with sometimes? Yes, because you have to tell it which agents in which systems are involved, or at least give it a, give it a name. Sometimes it can just be, you know, give it a name of an application, it could just be whatever they're looking at on their client. So you do, it doesn't have to be very narrowly defined. Yeah, yeah, and you can, you can create a, 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 an application on here called um, general problem or something. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. And then basically you're not gonna capture out there on those servers, you're gonna capture, just say for the last 10 minutes, I wanna see everything on their system. Yes. Yes, you have to give them permission to get in here and do this. In fact, it's kind of ironic. Um, when I go work with customers with this, it is rare that everybody has this. Why? Because then you, you would end up with five million trouble tickets. So what you do is you, you actually pick the extreme. You pick your best user. You know, everybody has users out there that they trust, that they like, they like working with. They're a little bit more savvy than the rest, right? And you give them this because they have a problem. You know that's an issue and you can help troubleshoot it. They can act, sometimes they can be really useful to help you find things. We all have those users, we all love them. However, their evil twin is the user that knows nothing and is your problem child that calls and calls and calls and calls and calls. Well, you also put this with them. It is amazing, frankly, that this actually will reduce the amount of calls that they give because they have to take action and it shows everything they were doing on their NIC and that makes them a little bit more shy sometimes about showing you that they had a problem because, oh, everything I was doing at the time on the network is gonna show up in this? Yes. Oh, maybe maybe suddenly that best basketball game I was watching is not causing me a problem anymore, right? And so I've actually seen that. So you give it to your best users, a handful, and, then you, and your worst users, the ones that complain all the time. And usually, and then you, you can set it, spread it out slowly. You typically don't deploy this en masse everywhere because it's just, it would be too overwhelming because everybody, oh, right, I got a tool I can just click whenever I have a problem and it, the queue would get ridiculous. We could, I mean, it'll handle it. If this will handle it, I don't want you to have to handle it. So that's why I'm making that recommendation. Any other questions? Questions? Oh, great question. The, so the question is, is can, I, can this go in and, and set up a span, basically? The, the answer is no, we, we don't. Um, with a caveat, the, so you can't go into a switch and set up a span through this tool. Um, what you can do though, is with our agents, you can fire off a capture. You don't have an agent deployed, so that actually um, through this interface it wouldn't work the same because this needs the software agent. But with the app transaction expert tool, which I'll show you in a few minutes, you can actually go talk to WAN accelerators and start a TCP dump on those. And what we do is it pushes out the filter and it's a real simple interface and it starts and stops the capture on there and pulls it back for you. Um, on the load balancers, WAN accelerators, um, anything that's basically a Unix system because you can run, we can log in and you can customize how it does that, which would include, you, there's probably ways to go in and do that on, on certain network devices. Okay, good question. Any other questions? Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a 10,000 foot view of Packet Trace Warehouse. Now, the, uh, one of the questions that usually comes up is, well, where's the warehouse, right? Where's the data stored? Well, there's a couple problems is, is that we don't want to be pulling massive captures back across the wire all the time and storing it at a central location. So these captures are stored out at the client 
until you captured them, until you retrieve them. And then you, so if there's something you need, you go out, you get it, you pull it back, and you analyze it. Make sense? Rather than streaming things, because you're going to just be have too much network traffic lag. Okay? Try to do things in situ. Now, what do you do with this data? Now, you guys obviously know the Wireshark and how to manipulate and look at packet data. But there's a couple things I do want to show you today. Um, and then maybe so we can get you to lunch early. Um, mapping. How many times have you guys gone in and they didn't have a clue what their application was really doing? Familiar? Anybody? I see some heads nodding. Okay. So let's pretend for a minute that we have a customer. This is not the diagram that I did for a customer. This is, this is because of uh, I'm, uh, we changed the names because I could guilty. But I'll pretend it was. Okay. So bear with me on this. I'm going to relate this to an actual story that I had. So going to a customer site for a complex application, they didn't know what their application did. All they knew maybe is an IP address. So you start typing an IP address. By the way, we've taken all those captures, right? We've done those in those mapping mode captures from those agents and pulled it into here. We can also take data off of our appliance that we have. We do have our packet capture appliance and then pull that data in as well. Or maybe they know a URL. So you can just start typing and you can see, oh, interesting, people have been going to Facebook. No shock here. But you can go in and start looking. In this case, the, all they know is the first tier server is called Mortgage Manager. That's the application I'm logging into. That's the server I'm talking to. I know that's the front part of this system. And so the system's going through and looking in its big, huge database, because we've pulled all this data back. By the way, in this case, there's data from um, many, 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 many thousands of systems in here that we've pulled. It's not just that from one single capture. But this is going in, and it goes, and it says, OK, I've seen, here's the Mortgage Manager. There are client machines talking to it, and it's talking to these other systems here. Okay. Now, I don't care about the clients at the moment. So what I want to do is I want to just look upstream at the server. And I also notice that it flagged Windows Update. And it put a cloud next to it. It's saying, there's enough traffic here that happened. I want you to see it. It might not be relevant. I'm putting a cloud next to it because it was actually outside your network. Okay. And what we're doing is we're filtering out. You know you guys have all the SMB and Sys noise out there? Right? There's all that noise in your network. We're not grabbing that. There has to be some sort of significant traffic transferred for us to be putting it here. In fact, you can go in and see if you click on some, if you click on one of these tiers, you can actually go through and see, okay, well, what traffic and relationships were discovered? Let me grab that. Sorry for the resolution here. But I can see what the different applications were in this case, because I clicked the uh, Windows update that it was doing. Uh, it's HTTPS. If I go and I click the mortgage manager, I can see that it's a server to that client. It's a client to this server. And so it shows all these relationships. Really nice stuff to have when you're trying to troubleshoot something. But we do have the Windows update. I'm going to get rid of that. So I just simply right click it and say, get rid of this guy. I don't care anymore. And now what I want to do is I want to go to the next level. And I want you to go ahead and draw for me what I got. So here I have another outside system. And now I have a map of my application. Now what's nice is, is that this goes in, it figured out that this is talking to the eligibility system, the eligibility system is talking to the case file system, that system is talking to underwriting. You can see the map of the application. Anybody think this might be useful for some of your daily chores? Okay. I'll tell you how this, I was doing this with a customer live with their data. And I'm working with them. And I had a room full of people um, in a conference room. And I brought up this, actually it's not this, but Let's pretend it was. And I hear, anybody ever try to show a technical point to a group of people and there's that guy in the back? Okay, I hear some snickering. So yes, you guys have experienced some of this. There was that guy in the back and he went, Let's see if I can do this right. He went, <laughs> and I thought, I'm sorry. What's and, I, and I said, is there a problem? He said, you're wrong. Your software is dead wrong. That is not the way our application functions. In fact, I know your software's wrong because that reporting server is a QA server. This is a production app. There's no way that that QA server is involved in this production app. So your application's wrong. And I said, well, actually, this, app, this is not what I think the application is doing. This is what the application did because we observed this through packet data on the wire. He said, no, that reporting server, that's a QA server. I said, you may want to check. So he kind of shrugged gets his laptop, and he runs out of the room. 
That was a QA server slated to be repurposed for another test that had been holding about three months worth of production data. Because it was involved in a transaction, somebody had screwed up somewhere, and they were about to have a major catastrophe. And we found it because we were able to go in, take the packet data, and make a, make a sensible map of their application and do it in a, in a reasonable manner. Make sense? Okay. Any questions? Okay. Questions? Um, these are, uh, it's going to show you the names or the IP addresses. So it's doing DNS lookups. Mm -hmm. So ni it's, it's really amazing how our demo data has really nice clean names on it. But yes, it'll go in and it'll show IP addresses and then you can rename them. So you can bring it up and you can say, oh, I want it to call it this. I can even put icons in there and say, I want this, this flavor of icon to show it's this database server. So you can make some pretty nice maps, and you can also go in, and, and once you've made a number of these application maps, you can then go in and say, and, and say, okay, if this server gets moved from this data center to this data center, show me, uh, of all those applications I've gone through the process of mapping, show me any application that depends on that server, and it will. So you can say, oh, I know I gotta do that. Or, what's nice about this is you can go to a system and say, I'm gonna move that case file server from this data center to the other data center, or even into a different building on the same campus, what applications are touching that? In fact, you go and you start by typing case file, you get that in there, you, and then you start looking at all the stuff it's touching so you know how to set up your firewall. So you can see all the rules, okay? And you see all the ports and everything that that system touched during the time duration of your capture. Make sense? Any other questions? Okay. So that's mapping. So we've shown you how to get packets from all over the place. We've shown you how to map packets. Let's show you how to do some troubleshooting the easy way. So I'm going to show you an example. This is a classic example. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a very simple example, but I like to use it because we've all run into this before. This is the classic. We have a customer at the data center, or in the, in the main office, and we're opening a branch office. In this case, we're going to do it across the country, but we're going to have a test office just across town and we're gonna have this transaction that runs really well locally. I mean, it runs in a couple seconds. You know, mission critical, this is a customer lookup in this case, and we put it across town and it's suddenly very slow. Okay, so what do people say? The network is slow, right? Now, in this case, it's a three millisecond link on, ten, on, a, on, a, on a lightly used 10 meg link, right? So 10 megs almost not being used over three milliseconds of latency, and yet it's the network. And now the ball is in your lap to try to figure out whether it's the network or whether it's not the network. Sound familiar? Right? That's a lot of your lives, I imagine, okay? So with this, what we do is, this is all packet data. I mean, this is coming just like you, in fact, under the hood, we leverage Wireshark. But you can see it's packet data, right? But what this does is it makes it very easy for me to show management and also, quite frankly, for me to find the answer very quickly. I can see how much data went across. I can also look at um, how many messages went across, how many packets, what was the latency, what was the bandwidth, or in this case, I'm gonna be a little lazy and just say, show me where the problem is. And it's gonna show me, okay, we're spending about nine and a half, nine, almost 10% on the state database server, about 11% on the client, 5% in protocol. I'm a little, have a little bit of congestion, which is odd because I don't really have any congestion on that link. I might wanna look at that a little bit further, okay? but I can have a little congestion. Bandwidth is barely utilized. Latency is the big, huge culprit. Okay, well, what's going on under there? So let's take a look. So if I do a diagnosis, it shows me processing overhead, protocol, chattiness, latency, bandwidth, congestion, transfer times, packet sequencing, windowing, all the stuff you're doing right now, it's going in there and it's flagging what is a bottleneck and what's a potential bottleneck. Notice all of the bottleneck stuff is right here around chattiness. You probably have never, in, nobody in here has probably experienced a chatty app on your network, right? Right, I teach them smirking. Um, it's hard for people, it's hard for people to get around this because SMB, SIP, is horrifically chatty, right? Um, but even worse, because they're trying to fix that, although it's been years, what about custom applications that were written in house, like this one? That's, that's very chatty. I go to management and I say, look, the application's too chatty, it's not using the net network very well, and management's typically gonna say, well, let's take more bandwidth, right? You've heard that. So in this case, I wanna do a couple of things. First of all, I saw that odd little congestion. That doesn't make any sense. I don't like the word congestion. Let's call it queuing delay, 
okay? And when I look at that, I get a graph. By the way, this is where the visualization helps, the ability to see the data graphically. Because what do you notice about this? This is the latencies on each packet and the deltas. Because what it does is it calculates what that should be based on um, serialization delay on bandwidth and what it observes um, at a baseline. So it looks at hacking typically to get to a baseline. And then it says, okay, this is above that. Notice that they're all roughly a millisecond more than they should be. Do you see that? It's a pattern. Remember I talked about looking at clouds and your brain looks for stuff? If, if this was all over the place, then the network had all kinds of weird latency on it, which was not, and I hate the word latency, but I say queuing delay, probably caused by other traffic. In this, almost every single packet is evenly distributed across that, that, um, that link, right, as far as latency. So what do you think that might be? Well, in this case, I actually had a case very similar to this. My customer was baffled. I said, well, do you have any encryption decryption devices on there? They said, well, yeah, we have an encryptor to decrypt. It was a military customer. Encryptor on one side, decryptor on the other. I said, there's your latency. There's your congestion. And you're queuing about every packet about a millisecond at each side as you encrypt and decrypt. Make sense? But by now figuring that out today, you know, just using Wireshark, which is phenomenal, but it, that wouldn't, it wouldn't pop out at you with this. You can see it. And that's why the visualization is nice and important. Other things that we can look at here and say, well, how about throughput? So this is the bandwidth we have. This is what we're using. In fact, the scale is so screwed, screwed up because of the, um, the fact that it's so low. Let's just look at it here. This is the, the amount of data I'm pushing across. So I'm pushing across about 120K. This is not a congested link. I don't need more bandwidth, okay? Well, maybe you do. Let's try to add bandwidth and see if that helps. You guys run into this, right? So in s now what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually, remember it was a chatty application? By the way, a rule of thumb, I don't like to see more than 50 app turns. That's, a, that's the measurement of back and forth on like a web page, a home page, right? I don't like to see more than a couple hundred on a WAN application or even a thousand is high, even on local area networks. Well, in this case, this has 2,157 app turns for that transaction going across this WAN. Let's look at that and do a, an analysis and a prediction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, this is what it would have been locally in a local area network, okay? Now here what I'm gonna do, and by the way, we redacted out the, um, the queuing delay as the encrypted decryptor. But here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, keeping everything else the same, let me make an obnoxious point to management and say, okay, let's do that. Let's add a terabit of bandwidth. So we just spent, we just spent a lot of money and yes, we definitely got about 0.1 seconds of improvement, right? So now I've predicted what adding bandwidth is gonna do for that transaction, and you can see it doesn't make a difference. Certainly not one worth noticing. And so you can predict what's going to happen using packet data. Now, you can also then go in and say, well, remember, this thing, wanted to, they wanted to go across the country with this. So coast to coast is about 50 milliseconds, single-sided. Watch as the latency increases, what the response time does. See that? And I can predict that coast to coast, we have almost a full two minutes when they were used to about three seconds. This would have been an utter disaster to be released across the network. We caught it, we troubleshot it, we predicted what would, would or would not help, and now I can, and we can display that in a meaningful way. Okay, you guys see the utility of something like this in your enterprise to, to help you out with some of these things? Okay. Um, one more thing is, is that I do wanna see the commands that are executed, and I can, show you the commands and how long they each take. And again, you can be looking for um, what's going on. We do a lot of decoding, we're using Wireshark. We also have some more that we built on top of that that are more uh, specific to applications to help get a handle on things. Any questions? Okay, so let me do a live capture and then I'm gonna open it up to questions and at that point I think we'll be at the end. Again, capture packets everywhere, analyze them and map them is what we're talking about. Now this capture, I can warn you in advance, is gonna be a little screwed up because the network here won't let me um, bridge my VM because I'm running a VM, as you can see. I'm running a VM. So I have to use um, Fusion's natting, which actually tweaks the accuracy. 
okay? So I'm warning you in advance, there's gonna be a little bit of confusion with the software because the acting's not gonna be perfect, okay? This is not an issue in most cases, it's only a VM running, or a Fusion running on my Mac, okay? But let's, let's pretend that we have been assigned the task of analyzing shark tanks, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze shark tanks. So let me call up the browser. What is, does anybody know what the web address here actually is? Let me, uh, it's sharkfest.org, right? Is it Wireshark? Well, I know that Wireshark, but I'm talking about this event. Sharkfest.wireshark.org. I'm capturing on an agent, one of those agents I told you about, on my laptop, on the NIC on my laptop. So it's captured. Let's go ahead and stop that capture. And then take a look at that, a look at that data. So that's the data. So what I've done is I've started a capture on the agent. You can do this from that central web console. I did it through here from the software here. Did a capture, I could have captured on the other side of the server if I had an agent there. Pull that data back. Now I'm gonna do a little filtering. Okay. Doing a DNS lookup to tell me what those particular t uh, tiers are or what those IP addresses are. And let's see if there's any here I can eliminate. Well, this one is just my demo VM. I can get rid of that. That's my uh, talking up to corporate. Um, I think most of the rest of this is related. Let's go ahead and include it all. Analyze that guy. There's SSL, which if I have a key, I can decrypt it. And here's what it looks like. So there's a whole lot of systems involved. Uh, most of them are tiny, so it's going out and talking to all these other servers. By the way, imagine you're a manager seeing this instead of a bunch of packets on Wireshark, right? You see how that useful that can be? What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go look at the bigger, heavier hitters. So I'm gonna get rid of the other ones. We're gonna focus on this conversation. That conversation took four seconds to pull that up, all of it on the server. There, there's your answer right there if they were saying it's a network problem. Make sense? Okay. Now, um, I'm gonna do a little bit more manipulation here just to show you how it works. Okay, um, I'm gonna edit the locations. This is where it didn't know because of the fact that it is, um, because the acting was manipulated. You're gonna see it scream at me here in a second with a red notification. I'm on a, um, I believe it's 54 megs. That's my wireless adapter, okay. So you can see it broke it down into throughput. There's the throughput, there's the bandwidth, okay? I only had one little spike at about 14 megabits. Um, I have a little protocol here that shows my in-flight data. I can see the time spent on my client and on the server diagnosis. It's showing that there are some retransmissions. For some reason, there's a lot of wireless stuff out here. I'm shocked to everybody here, so I use a laptop, right? Some retransmission statistics. There's 73 app turns, which is actually pretty good. Now, I didn't grab this beforehand. I was hoping that SharkFest had a good website. It does, 73 app turns isn't bad. 50 is kind of my benchmark for ideal. When I work with customers on this, sometimes there's these hundreds and hundreds for a homepage. And it's shocking, and then they wonder, how come it's so slow? Now here we can look, there's 31 Git, 20 P JPEG, uh, four JavaScript, three, uh, I'm sorry, uh, PNG, three JPEG, two style sheets, typically you need one. Uh, HTML, we are using compression, that's good. These are the commands that are being executed. We can break that out and see the commands. And what we're doing here is we have a whole lot of little uh, images. You see that? Okay, those can be put into a sprite if they're static and done that way. Um, and then let's do a prediction. Now, the, the prediction I like to do is this. So if I'm going to um, put this on a 3G cell phone, how long would it take? In this case, it's pretty good. But what's nice is, is that you can go in and say, oh, I was a customer and I showed them this with their website and then I said, on a 3G cell phone, they said, well, that's a real important market, right? Because you have tablets and stuff out there. And I did it and it took like 34 seconds and this was a major, I, you would all know who their name was if I told you, but it was a customer facing web page, and they said, you can't be right. So they took out their phone and, and it took exactly as long as they predicted. The point being, we're able to do analysis, prediction, and show these things graphically and even put these into a report format in a very, very brief amount of time. So in fact, I can click report, make a word report. Now I'm gonna tell my manager that I'm going to spend the weekend doing this because 
you know, gosh, I'm, it's so important to get this stuff done. But this is, and, and I can say, okay, I'm spending hours and hours and hours making this report, and then I can turn in this report that shows applicable table of contents, executive summary explaining what the problem was, um, graphs and charts, there's our pie charts, there's our summary of delays, there's the bottlenecks and potential bottlenecks that we looked at, e e explanations for all of those. Um, more supporting charts and data here, our prediction will pop up, Oops, there's our prediction, you see the prediction in there, and, and the, an appendix, okay? Do you guys think this might make your life a little easier than some of the tasks? How long would it take you guys to analyze something like that now? Anybody wanna volunteer any answers? Not you, I know you. Talk about somebody else that doesn't have this. Yes, yeah, see the, the, the phrase I usually use is, how long would it take you to do this using your existing technology? That doesn't count if you own this. Anybody else, I mean, you can see this is gonna speed you up. And this also allows people that are not packet experts to do analysis for you and get to the bottom of problems. And, and you can take this and, uh, in fact, Janice, I'm gonna put you on the spot. This makes your life easier, correct? dramatically when it, you're de dealing with packets. So, yes. You're asking me a roadmap question and we're not in a roadmap meeting with our NDAs and everything in place. Let's, let's just say that the synergy between pilots, Riverbed's pilot and Riverbed's app transaction experts has been duly noted and that I would say that it is a reasonable expectation to assume that good things are gonna happen with, with those, those two tool sets, okay? But that's as much as I'm gonna say. We can talk about network. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so at this point, um, I think we're a little, we're early. I'll cut you loose, which, what's that? <laughs> yeah, nobody's gonna complain about being early, right? If you have any questions, please come see me. I appreciate your time, thank you very much. I'm hoping that some of this stuff sparks something that may, may be of use for you. If so, um, you can come talk to me. I'll get you in touch with the right people. Um, have a great conference. Thanks for coming.